Hi, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And yesterday, well, they had a memorial service for this little boy the, who was known as the boy in the box, also as America's unknown boy, um, because he was found in 1957. Uh, he was found naked, beaten, and dead inside a bassinet box thrown 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 into a bunch of grass somewhere near Philadelphia or in Philadelphia uh, area. Um, and the case has gone unsolved for 64 years. And um, what's interesting about this case, uh, you know, I've had people asking me, can I, can I analyze this case? Would I profile this case? Because it's so fascinating to so many people. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the problem of trying to analyze what is very much a very cold case and a very historic case now. However, if you've been paying attention to the news, it's just been announced uh, by the Philly police that they are, think we're, they're going to solve this case by the end of the year. That's pretty interesting. And what would bring this about? How are they going to solve this case? How are they going to find out who this boy is and who killed him? Um, and I'll, uh, here's how it works. So this was a huge case when it happened in 1957, huge case. I mean, they, they worked their butts off to try to find out who killed this little boy. They put out a tremendous amount of information to the public. Flyers went out everywhere to get somebody to say who this boy was. And they never found out. Uh, and they followed lots and lots of interesting, weird leads, you know, to foster homes where the child may have been abused and then tossed and to other, you know, other weird people who may, kept him in the basement and tortured him and then he died and then they threw him away. There's quite a few different stories, all reasonable stories for a child who ends up in this situation uh, between four and six years old. And obviously he didn't have a very good life. He was like 30 pounds when he was found. Um, so he was emaciated, obviously hadn't been properly fed. He had a lot of scars on his body. Um, he didn't have broken bones, interestingly enough, but he, he didn't have a good life um, and nobody's able to identify him. And that leads me to the first point I would make is that I'm going to say he's probably not old enough to go to school because had he been old enough to go to school, then he would have been missed from that school. So if somebody would have said, well, you know, this little boy hasn't shown up. And then when they see the flyers every place, they go, wait a minute, that's a little boy in my first grade class. Um, 1957, yeah, kindergarten existed. Uh, so he wasn't in kindergarten. Now, uh, most kids didn't have preschool in those days, so they wouldn't go to school until they were at least five or six. So I'm going to say more likely he was four years old. Um, and because of that, uh, he may not have been noted by people who lived in the neighborhood. Um, also, it's very possible that the family, I'm going to say, wasn't very well connected to people in the neighborhood. In other words, they, they weren't interacting a lot so that people would know what children lived in that home. Either they lived apart from people, so people didn't actually know who was in the home, or they moved around a lot, so they were kind of, you know, uh, the, the kind that shows up down the end of the block or in the apartment, but they're not there long and then they're gone again. Um, and so nobody gets to really know them and they can easily say something like, Oh yeah, my, you know, if, if one of the children is missing, they could simply say, Oh yeah, he he's living with his aunt now, or whatever. And people aren't going to pay attention particularly. So I don't think that the family was well connected anywhere. Um, and that's probably why nobody's able to identify him. Um, the other possibility is, he hardly ever saw the light of day. Perhaps he was kept in a basement and tortured. Um, and therefore, people didn't know that he was there. Um, he was found in a, a bassinet box. Possible that the box itself was from a, a later baby. Um, maybe they got their little baby, cute little baby girl, and this little boy was just, and maybe he had uh, you know mental problems or some kind of physical problems, and he wasn't liked by whomever was caring for him. Uh, so he was the one that they abused and they focused on abusing him, but then they had the cute little girl or something. Maybe they took the little girl out. The little girl went out in the pram and all this stuff, but the boy was never seen. Possible. But it's been 64 years. And can you solve a crime after 64 years? <clears throat> now, I can go back and look at all those suspects, but I actually do not know much, if, even if I read the police reports, because the police reports are written so long ago. I don't know 
how good the interviews were. I don't know whether the, the, the information they found out really makes any sense. I just don't know. Uh, it's, it's, too far, it's too far in the past and it's too convoluted for me to make determinations on what is accurate and what is not accurate. So the, interestingly, um, in 1998, um, there's an organization around in Philadelphia called the VDOC Society. And kind of a, in my opinion, a bit of a peculiar organization. Um, it's, it's got um, profilers and ex, uh, retired detectives, and they meet once a month um, on a Thursday and have this fancy kind of lunch with white tablecloths, and they discuss cases uh, over lunch. And a, a police department can come and present a case, and then they'll consider that case for basically for profiling and analyzing. They didn't invite me. Okay. It's, I'm not bitter. <laughs> it's just a very unique society that I haven't been a part of. Um, they supposedly had some success with a couple cases, but I haven't heard a lot of success because I just don't know. You know, cold cases are almost impossible to solve, so I can't even blame them for that. You can do all this theorizing, but um, usually the way cases get solved is DNA. So all of a sudden we had the Philly Police Department saying, because there's this guy who worked there, let's see his name. He's the head of the Philly Police Department now. His name is Jason Smith. Um, he hopes to identify this boy by the end of the year. Um, well, they've been doing a lot with familial DNA. So it is possible that now the DNA will help identify him. But then he also says something to the effect of we can get the suspect, you know, we can get our suspect. And I'm thinking, okay, if this boy was... I'm going to say four years old when he was killed. That means the mother was probably at least 16. Okay, that would put her at 20 when the boy was killed. It's been 64 years. That mother's 84 years old. Uh, I don't know how old daddy is, but, you know, that's two not-so-young people if they're still alive. And usually when you have a child who's in this kind of condition when he's killed, um, you don't have the greatest home life. And usually the people that live in that home life, the, the adults probably have less than healthy lifestyles. They may have high alcohol, may drink a lot of alcohol. They may do, do some kind of drugs. They may not eat properly. They may have just rough, tough lives. They usually don't live into their eighties. So my guess is <clears throat> whoever the parents of this child are, uh, was, uh, they're probably not alive today. I find that unlikely. Um, so will they ever be able, they're not going to be able to, I don't believe, identify who committed the crime. Now, what they could do is if they can find the DNA that links familial DNA, that eventually they can track down his family line, you know, the aunts, the uncles and all that. They may be able to talk to people who say, you know, my aunt told me this story and she's not with us anymore, but she told me the story about her sister. And she said that her sister, you know, left the state and she didn't see her for years, but she had, she heard that, you know, they had had a boy, but then she never saw the boy. That may happen. And that would be very nice to finally, um, you know, put an end to the curiosity and be able to, to identify this, this little boy and give him a name. Um, but, and you wonder, you know, why do people pursue these extremely cold cases and spend years and years? The VDOC Society, the guy who started that, his name is Bill Fleischer. Um, he said, 1998, we start, we had all these theories. It might be a Hungarian kid. He might be this, he might be that. Everything became a dead end. So you spend an awful lot of time spinning your wheels most of the time. But I think it's, it, the reason people pursue these things is because it's such a mystery. It's like a, it's like a huge treasure hunt. And your chances of finding the treasure are very, very tiny, but if you can, wouldn't that be exciting? So, you know, so far they haven't had much success, but, you know, now that they had this, you know, memorial service and they brought the, the, the this case up again in the media, and now we have the Philly uh, police detective saying, we're going to solve it this year. Keep that in mind. And uh, let's see whether they have that kind of luck to be able to solve this particular case that has been unsolved for 64 years. So anyway, that's the best I can do with the case. Uh, and that's, you know, the amount of time I'm going to put into it. So I'm going to wait and see whether DNA does actually eventually win the day. So thank you for being here with me. And I hope you enjoyed this segment on uh, the boy in the box.